in a home in a secluded area of Beverly Hills, including actress Sharon Tate. A terrorist attack on three Tokyo subway lines during this morning's rush hour has so far killed at least six people. I used to think that people would have to be mildly mentally ill or pretty severely mentally ill to be drawn into a cult. And I totally uh, disagree with that now. They allege that those who try to leave the colony are beaten and drugged. It's also possible that the cult leader has raped dozens of children. What these organized groups have evolved into is organizations of power, money, and sex. The bodies were reported to be the victims of a mass suicide pact, though some had been murdered. Passions and commitments that can be engendered by religion are extraordinarily powerful, and sometimes no other human beings can stand in their way. Mass suicide, murder, child abuse, terrorism, cults are synonymous with tragedy and disaster. But nobody sets out to join a cult. People join a new religion, work for a cause, or start a political movement. From the inside, the group is noble, inspirational. But then, a line is crossed, and a group becomes a cult. It needs to have three characteristics to call it a cult. One is that the guru becomes worship rather than the broader religious principles. Case file, Om Shinrikyo. Japanese cult leader Shoko Asahara convinced disciples that he was Christ reincarnated and that they must surrender their will to his for ultimate salvation. Another characteristic is that it has thought reform-like characteristics, that is, systematic indoctrination with a great focus on confession, criticism, self-criticism in a systematic way. Case file, Jonestown. Jim Jones held all-night preaching sessions where cultists would be forced to confess their sins in public so that Jones could issue brutal public beatings. A third characteristic has to do with heavy exploitation from above, usually the guru himself or herself and other high-ranking people, and that exploitation tends to be economic and sexual. Case file, FLDS. May 2006, cult leader Warren Jeffs is named one of America's 10 most wanted. His crime, as leader of the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, a polygamous cult, Warren Jeffs stands accused of the rape and imprisonment of children. But even with their leader on the run from the law, the members of Jeffs' cult see themselves as faithful followers of God, not a band of criminals. One man's cult is another man's religion. It has been that way since ancient times. 2,000 years ago, a carpenter, a prostitute, and 12 other outcasts started a cult that challenged all social values of the time. They believed their leader was God himself, that he had the power to walk on water and even rise from the dead. They believed he would form a new kingdom and their obsession with revolution worried local authorities. For decades, followers of the Nazarene, called Christians, were viewed as a cult by the Roman authorities. Christianity starts as a dissident movement within Judaism. So already there's tension between Judaism and the Jesus movement as it takes place. Certainly also, preaching about a kingdom is going to make the Romans nervous. They have a kingdom that they're happy with. So we have a charismatic leader with a message that challenges both religious and secular authorities. It would take hundreds of years for Christianity to become a mainstream religion. In fact, many of the world's major religions, Buddhism, Islam, Mormonism, have come from similar roots. They have all endured the suspicion and persecution that comes with the label of cult. I think people fear the cult because they fear difference in a lot of ways. And this is a manifestation of religious difference. Most cults are nonviolent, and some have lost the label and become mainstream. Religion itself is not the problem, but cult leaders use religion to commit heinous and terrifying crimes. 
The kind of crimes that have led the FBI to hunt down Warren Jeffs, leader of the polygamous cult, FLDS. John Llewellyn, a former sex crime investigator with the Utah Sheriff's Office, has investigated several polygamous cults in Utah. While I was a deputy sheriff, I was in charge of all the sex crimes. And the captain started giving me these uh, complaints about polygamy. And I knew very little about polygamy, and so being a good detective, I started to read up on it, uh, so I'd know better how to handle these. Several polygamous cults have spread throughout the western U.S., reaching a population of over 30,000. Though they split off from the mainstream Mormon church a century ago, they are erroneously referred to as Mormon fundamentalists. Both groups take their theology from the Book of Mormon and trace their faith back to the prophet Joseph Smith. But only the polygamous cults, as opposed to the Mormons, cut themselves off from society to hide their secret lifestyle. A lifestyle they practice because, according to their theology, it's the only path that leads to heaven. And they believe that for every wife, they will have a world. They will be the god of every world, one for each wife. And that wife will be the Eve of, of that world. And it will only be the Mormons who will have sex in heaven. As an undercover agent, Llewellyn expected to research polygamy as an outsider. But as he learned more, he and his wife soon found themselves in an unexpected position. This lady with three little girls, a single mom, asked if we wouldn't adopt her children if something happened to her. So I, I told my wife, I said, let's tell her we're studying Mormon fundamentalism, polygamy, and that might discourage her. To my surprise, two weeks later, she came to my wife and asked if she couldn't be part of our family. Llewellyn joined a polygamous cult, bringing a second wife into his home. Devotion to the cult had made him discard his lifelong Christian values. In Llewellyn's case, all three adults consented to the polygamous arrangement. But in many households of the FLDS, polygamy takes an even darker form. Not all women are child brides in these polygamous households of the FLDS, but many are. Uh, children as young as 12 or 14 are marriageable. In the FLDS, Warren Jeffs routinely forces girls into marriages with men old enough to be their fathers. And in this cult of thousands, it's impossible to say how many girls have been forced to have sex against their will. Up until the relatively recent present, there had been a period of turning a blind eye to what was going on. But now there have been a number of indictments made against Warren Jeffs, and there has finally been the elevation of Jeffs to one of the ten most wanted men uh, by the FBI. In May 2006, Warren Jeffs became one of the FBI's ten most wanted. But apprehending Jeffs wouldn't be easy. Upon taking over leadership of the FLDS, Warren Jeffs directed the construction of a 1,700-acre compound outside El Dorado, Texas. The centerpiece is a fortress-like temple, a huge white beacon amid the dusty Texas plains that cultists believe to be the most holy place on Earth. Here, at the Yearning for Zion Ranch, the cult has been able to carry out its abuse of children away from the eyes of the law. Warren Jeffs is the latest example of a cult leader. A man driven by power, paranoia, and greed. But as the manhunt for Jeffs continued, unknown numbers of girls became unwilling brides. Each day Jeffs remained free, a girl paid a horrifying price. August 28th, 2006. Las Vegas police pull over a red SUV on a routine traffic violation. But the man at the wheel is no routine criminal. It is Warren Jeffs, one of America's 10 most wanted fugitives. Like most cult leaders, Warren Jeffs has been using religion to act out his fantasies. Fantasies of domination and greed. Dependent on secrecy, 
he built a temple to his perversity in the isolated plains of Texas. But now, the prophet has a problem. Locked up in a federal prison, Jeffs is finally to be punished for his crimes. And when cult leaders are cornered, they can drive the cult to self-destruct. Guyana, 1977. 30 years before Warren Jeff's capture, another cult leader found himself the object of investigation. Rather than be caught and punished for his crimes, Jim Jones led his followers on a journey of paranoia and madness. Authorities didn't foresee that it would end in a massacre. Hundreds of corpses heaped upon one another in testament to the terrifying power of a cult. Lynn, Indiana, 1941. Ten-year-old pastor Jim Jones is preparing for one of his first church services. Neglected by his parents and often alone, Jim seeks comfort in the stories of the Bible. The cult leaders have early experiences of neglect, of abandonment, of disappointment in parental figures and authorities. A poor and lonely child, Jim's interest in the Bible leads him to a Pentecostal church on the outskirts of town. Believing in salvation through the Holy Spirit, Pentecostalists demonstrate their faith by speaking in tongues and witnessing faith healings often ostracized for their own extreme behavior. The Pentecostalists offered Jim acceptance. I joined a Pentecostal church because they were the most despised. They were the rejects of the community. I found immediate acceptance, and I must say, in all honesty, as much love as I could interpret love. Religion offered Jim Jones the hope and acceptance he needed, but it was power that he craved. He quickly learned to twist religion for his own selfish needs, luring children to his house for Bible study, and then locking them in. Raised in poverty, Jones was convinced that a church should provide for its congregants. By the time he started his own church, the young preacher had formed a vision of socially minded ministry that he termed apostolic socialism. Jim Jones's cult early on in Indiana was very helpful to the local community. They provided soup kitchens for the uh, elderly and for poverty stricken people. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, minister the sick and the needy. I mean, that was the core of what the temple was about. Ostensibly, that's what the core of what the temple was about. That's what I believe the temple was about. By the age of 35, Jim Jones is a success. The church he started as a young preacher, newly named People's Temple, is attracting scores of new members. He's found a wife who shares his commitment to racial equality, and together they have adopted a veritable rainbow family. But Jim's radical politics and liberal attitude are too much for conservative Indiana. Early on, he was a guy with some very strong ideals in an unaccepting culture. He had the notion of racial immigration in a tough town like Indi Indianapolis that, that didn't support that idea. Despite the growth of his congregation, Jones feels persecuted and misunderstood. His childish need for attention has matured into a full-blown hunger for power. And he must move his church to a place where it can mature a place that welcomes progressive ideas, social activism, and radical politics. He moves the People's Temple to Northern California. The Bay Area would provide the perfect social climate for the People's Temple. From progressive communities in and around San Francisco, Jim Jones would recruit a small army of hardworking people devoted to social action. The progressive community in San Francisco and the liberal community loved us because we were uh, clean-cut and responsible and we had money and we helped people. 
rest homes for the elderly, tutoring classes for students, free legal advice. People's Temple provided a variety of social services, but for Jim, the social programs served a more selfish need. Most of these uh, destructive cult leaders fit at least eight of the nine criteria for narcissistic personality uh, disorder. Jim Jones, in all of his social programs and his uh, congregation's involvement in the community, increasingly um, built his own sense of power and significance and glory in these projects. The progressive atmosphere of San Francisco afforded a lot of opportunity for an activist church like Jones's. But the quest for power and glory was only part of his motivation. The driving force in the move to California was his exceedingly strong paranoia. In 1962, Esquire magazine published an article on the nine safest places to hide in the event of a nuclear attack. Redwood Valley, just outside San Francisco, was one of them. Jones had had a vision that the Midwest was to be destroyed in a nuclear attack, and it was therefore essential to move quickly. He even set specific dates for this nuclear explosion that would begin the end of the world. I have given the date, the month, and the year where a nuclear war will take place. I want to be like Jonah of old. I want to be proven wrong. I'll be happy if one of my prophecies fail. They haven't yet, but I'll be glad when one of them does. The move from Indiana was only Jones's first step in a dark descent. One that would drive his doomed temple much further than San Francisco. San Francisco, 1969. The good deeds of the People's Temple masked the narcissism and paranoia of its leader, Jim Jones. But as the temple continues to build its reputation in San Francisco, cracks are starting to appear in Jones's smooth facade. He wore country western outfits, uh, bright, bright suits, that sort of thing. Didn't fit into San Francisco. Always dark glasses, inside, outside, any time of day. Uh, always surrounded by uh, this coterie of uh, protectors and kind of interpreters. Every big shot's got uh, sidekicks, aides, that kind of thing. But Jones was by no means in, in the major leagues. But despite these early warning signs, the temple was still attracting new members, especially young men and women looking to become politically active. In 1968, 20-year-old Tim Carter, a native of the Bay Area, was just returning from combat in Vietnam. By the time that I got out of the bush, my politics had been rearranged completely 180 degrees I was very political I it, it was I was part of the counterculture it was a movement it's hard to describe it it was either you were part of it or you weren't and I was a part of it and the Bay Area was probably the focal point for the counterculture upon his return from Vietnam Tim was quickly immersed in California's hippie culture living on the streets hitchhiking up and down the coast and experimenting with alternative spiritual movements but he would soon find a new direction, a cause to devote his life to. So we were doing a meditation, myself and five other friends, and all of a sudden I felt this explosion of energy go up my spine from behind. There was this like bang. And I turned around and I saw this picture. And I said, who is that? She goes, oh, that's Papa Jim. He's the most loving man I've ever met in my life. Tim attended his first meeting of the People's Temple in San Francisco. I walked into the temple and it was the most alive place that I'd been in. I mean, I saw black folks and white folks and teenagers flirting with each other and little kids running around and I saw white people helping old black seniors and it just, and there was nothing pretentious about it or phony. It was just a place that was filled with life. But I hadn't even met Jim Jones and I knew that I'd known those people forever. Uh, I was home. As a member of the counterculture, Carter was already attracted to social activism. Like other cults, the temple used good intentions to draw people in. At their sort of full crest, the temple was probably two or 3,000 people. It definitely grew in size when it was located in San Francisco, and they were very active in recruiting. To a potential recruit, People's Temple was a model organization. 
and Jim Jones, its loving and spiritual father. I think Jones, by and large, had a benign and, and, and positive image. I don't think most people knew him real well, but publicly, if you asked any political leader or social leader, they said, yeah, he's a good guy. But here's the interesting thing. As I got more interested in Jones, I would ask some of the same people uh, in a kind of quiet way off the record. And they say, there's something odd about this guy. There was something eerie about this guy, the way he had total mastery over this finger snap army that he could get to show up anywhere. The power Jones exerted over his followers didn't escape Marshall Kilduff. His in-depth interviews with ex-members of the cult uncovered disturbing details about life on the inside. The malignant narcissist has a desire deep down of bringing down other people in a way that they feel brought down. And that leads to extremes. According to Kilduff's research, people were working inhumane hours, often seven days a week, on the temple's various programs. At the temple itself, members were forced to confess to fabricated crimes for which they would be given vicious beatings. Ex-members asserted even children were being abused in this way. According to their descriptions, Jones was a classic cult leader, using spirituality to exert power psychologically and sexually over his cult. But were these allegations true? I thought I knew a lot while I was there, but what I was seeing was not what the reality was. Jones using drugs. I didn't know he used drugs back then. The combination of heroin and speed, that's pretty potent stuff. I didn't know that he was having sex with everybody. It's easy to see now, but you don't think that the leader is, um, is nuts. San Francisco isn't the safe haven Jones thought it would be. And as the pressure builds, he's starting to lose control. But exposing the truth about a cult leader can have deadly consequences. By the end of 1977, Jim Jones is feeling heat from the press. Rumors of sexual and physical abuse run rampant while reporters continue to seize upon the story. I mean, we have conspiracies to deal with. I could name you 15 different conspiracies. Those who want to break uh, progressive, nonviolent forces working for change within society, they've got a great willingness to be cynical and believe the worst about people. You don't hear much uh, uh, promotion of good things about people, but you sure hear a hell of a lot bad. Again, feeling persecuted, Jim Jones loads up the buses one last time. The temple members that I sort of heard from later did get the sense that the temple was kind of on the run, uh, was uh, in a sort of dire situation that needed uh, some sort of correcting. They had to get out of San Francisco. In 1977, Marshall Kilduff's article appeared in New West magazine, exposing the abuse within People's Temple. But by the time the article is published, the temple was already in the midst of a mass exodus. In a matter of months, almost a thousand people are relocated to Guyana, South America. After a long flight to the capital of Georgetown, temple members endure a grueling 36-hour trek by boat and jeep. Finally, they arrive at the humble cabins of the People's Temple Agricultural Project, a.k.a. Jonestown. Here, in the isolation of deep jungle, Jones believes he can finally have complete control. Well, for a guy who loved the public limelight and liked to uh, attract new followers, he couldn't square that with Jonestown. But he clearly wanted uh, more total control, a place he could really be all by himself. Maybe that's what he always wanted, create his own world. Jonestown, 1977. With a young wife and new baby, Tim Carter still hung on to that initial faith he had in the People's Temple. Like some other cult members, he had begun to distrust Jones, but still he chose to stay. Some members explained this to Marshall Kilduff. They said we all had joined the temple for a lot of reasons. We wanted a better society, an integrated world, uh, a meaningful life, and it was hard to turn back from that idea to sort of say, well, I was wrong, I'm a fool, and now I want to leave. The cultist's commitment was tested again and again. 
residents would be subjected to more public beatings and humiliations. Disobedience was punished with solitary confinement, and some were even put down with sedatives, leaving them in a permanent semi-conscious state. The extreme tactics were justified by Jones's paranoia. He believed they were under siege. Well, this whole siege mentality was developed by Jones as a way to draw people closer to the temple as it, as it became more cut off, more estranged from the real world. The members were made to feel kind of on edge. The senses were just overloaded. You worked hard, you were given lousy food, you were told your life was endangered. So, so they were really driven to distraction by a series of these kinds of uh, treatments. Like all cults, the People's Temple had gone through a metamorphosis. What was supposed to be an oasis of communal living, a socialist paradise of brotherly spirit, had quickly changed into a police state. The hippie commune had become a prison camp. But the transformation of Jonestown was merely a reflection of the change in Jones. The lonely little boy who had become a warm, generous preacher had morphed into a desperate, paranoid dictator. At the very end, this guy was a drug addict, uh, delusional, um, crazy. There was worry that the temple was really getting to an unhinged point. Back in the U.S., someone decided to step in. San Francisco Congressman Leo J. Ryan is enlisted by a group of relatives of temple members who are unable to make contact with their family in Jonestown. Concerned relatives are beating their heads against the wall here. You're a congressman. Maybe you can get something more done that we haven't been able to do on our own. And he made plans to go to Guyana and after a lot of fencing around uh, with the temple, uh, finally succeeded in convincing him to let him in. Jim Jones is in a tight spot. He's been chased from Indiana to California, all the way to Guyana. And now, a congressman is showing up at his front door. The pressure is pushing Jones to the edge, and there's nowhere left to run. On November 17th, the congressman arrives in Jonestown with his aides, a few journalists, and members of concerned relatives. At first, Ryan is genuinely impressed. A few conversations I've had with some of the folks here already this evening that uh, whatever the comments are, there's some people here who believe that this is the best thing that ever happened in their whole life. But at some point during the show, a note is passed to one of the guests. A temple member wants to leave Jonestown. The news starts a domino effect, and others begin approaching Ryan and saying that they too are being held prisoner. Soon, a group of nine are ready to leave with the congressman. Jones is disappointed. Leave us. I just beg you, please leave us. Bill, we will bother nobody. Anybody wants to get out of here can get out of here. These people get ready to go. It's these nine people are leaving with the congressman. It's about 1.30, 2 o'clock in the afternoon when it's just out of nowhere. Just out of nowhere. The sky turned, I'm not talking metaphorically, the sky turned almost black. It was a freak storm. It was like evil itself blew into Jonestown. Everything changed. Everything changed on that wind and on that storm. Ryan and his entourage are forced to wait out the storm. But Jim Jones knows that he cannot allow anyone to leave Jonestown. You could see on his face, his mood changed. He just got darker. I'm talking about his energy got darker, uglier. In an act of desperation, Jim Jones orders an aide named Don Sly to do the unthinkable. And he walked up behind Ryan, and all of a sudden he pulls out a knife and he says, all right, mother you're gonna die. Tim Carter and others wrestle the assailant to the ground. The congressman is unhurt, though shaken, and quickly leaves Jonestown. It's hard to even describe the horror that I felt, or the shock. I had been playing peace and love for all these years, you know, and I woke up with a murderous monster, you know, as a leader. A few hours later, Congressman Leo J. Ryan, along with four others from the group, is gunned down at Port Kaituma Airstrip in Guyana on strict orders from Jim Jones. 
But at Jonestown, only Jones is aware of the murder. Calm and collected, he calls a meeting at the main pavilion. As the meeting starts, Tim Carter is sent on an errand. The reason I saw what I saw is because I had been sent from Jones and Scottish to the pavilion to ask him if he wanted a truck to take us to the front gate, which was three miles from there. By the time I got got there, they had, people had just started dying. There was maybe, whatever it was, 10 or 12 people that were on the ground. Jim Jones had come to Guyana to start a new world, but no one knew it would become a hell on Earth. For hundreds of men, women, and children, there would be no escape from Jonestown. At a remote airstrip in a South American jungle, Congressman Leo J. Ryan has just become the only U.S. congressman ever to die in the line of duty, a victim of cult violence. By ordering the death of a U.S. congressman, Jim Jones has sealed the fate of People's Temple. Rather than face punishment for his crimes, he chooses death for himself and everyone in Jonestown. My opinion is that we be kind to children and be kind to seniors and take the portion like they used to take in ancient Greece and step over quietly because we are not committing suicide. It's a revolutionary act. We can't go back. We won't leave us alone. They're now going back to tell more lies, which means more congressmen. And there's no way, no way we can survive. While hundreds were listening to Jones' speech at the main pavilion, a few high-level members had been preparing the deadly potion, a lethal dose of cyanide dissolved in grape-flavored punch. There are people who are screaming, let's not do this, and what about this option, and have we really, isn't there anything else we can do, uh, uh, Father Jim? And he would talk them down, berate them, and they were, many of them led to this vat of, of poison. And then suddenly, around the edges, appeared guys with guns, shepherding, pushing people towards uh, taking the drink. Temple member Tim Carter, confused and stunned, witnessed the beginning of the deaths. I was absolutely conflicted. There was a part of me that said, everybody's going to die. Another part of me that said, no, this doesn't make any sense. This is not going to happen. In shock and disbelief, Tim Carter fled to the relative safety of the Guyanese jungle. But at the main pavilion, Jim Jones was turning Jonestown into a mass grave. Over 900 men, women, and children were poisoned at Jonestown including Tim Carter's wife and one-year-old son. Along with Carter, only a few others escaped from Jonestown with their lives. Jones himself was found with a fatal gunshot wound to the head. In the aftermath of Jonestown, Many presume that the cult members drank poison willingly, in enthusiastic obedience to their leader, Jim Jones. But in recent years, it has come to light that many of the people at Jonestown were forcibly injected with poison, and many others were forced to drink poison at gunpoint. Were we flawed as human beings? Yes. Were we flawed as a group? Yes. Did the people who die there die in some kind of mindless ritual orgy of suicide because they believe in this guy? No, it's not what happened. A lot of good people died in Jonestown that day that deserve a lot more respect than they have been afforded as human beings. The people of Jonestown tried to build a better world, but they put their faith in a madman who were massacred by his hand. We may never fully understand the events that brought them to this unbelievable end. For almost 30 years, Jonestown has remained the icon of cult tragedy. Still, new cults continue to rise, some in even more bizarre and terrifying forms. As the new millennium approached, cults all over the world became obsessed with the idea that the year 2000 would bring apocalypse. An 
epidemic of apocalypticism gripped the world in the late 1990s. Most cults simply watched and waited for the final days. But in Japan, one cult decided they can actively bring the apocalypse into being through terrorism. In 1995, Om Shinrikyo was a wildly successful new religion based in Tokyo. Led by a mysterious partially blind guru named Shoko Asahara, Om synthesized various Hindu and Buddhist teachings in a quest for spiritual purity. But like so many cult leaders, Asahara's quest for purity led to apocalyptic fascination. In Om Shinrikyo, one does not simply passively await for the end of the world to take place. One joins in that process to help it along. Asahara's apocalyptic obsession was a full-time project for the cult. In blind obedience to their leader, the cult members poured their resources into a deadly scheme. They would release poison gas all over Tokyo. The Japanese would think the Americans had done it. The Americans would think the Japanese had done it. Other major powers would be drawn in. World War III would begin. And through World War III would come the biblical Armageddon. March 20th, 1995, Monday morning rush hour. As millions of commuters board the Tokyo subways, members of Om Shinrikyo release a deadly nerve agent on five different trains throughout the city. The chemical weapon is known to cause suffocation, convulsions, and death. Nearly 5,000 people were injured in the Tokyo subway attack, and 1,000 required hospitalization. 11 were killed. In the months that followed, governments began to realize the horrible implications. As powerful weapons land in the hands of fanatic cults obsessed with apocalypse, disaster will strike. Around the world, police prepared to do battle with the terrorist cult. It wasn't the kind of terrorist group that wanted to hijack planes or do simple acts of what we think of as terrorism. What Ohm kind of suggested was a wider goal, a more ambitious goal, of changing the world, remaking the world. With the significance of the year 2000 in many religious traditions, including the stories of the Book of Revelation, the FBI began an ambitious project to identify which cults out of the thousands in existence had the potential to become dangerous. In 1999, they released the Project Megiddo Report. One of the fears behind the Project Megiddo Report is that any millennialist group that imagines a catastrophic end of the world might itself turn to violence. But again, the report fails to distinguish between rhetorical violence descriptions that happen in texts and actual violence perpetrated in the world by people who take those descriptions seriously. In trying to prevent cultic violence, law enforcement authorities must walk a fine line. The line between a religion and a cult. In a society where religious faith is praised but religious violence is condemned, there will always be opportunities for cultic tragedy. As long as there is a call in a religious community to live a life that is different from the life everybody else lives, to obey laws or practices that might be different from everybody else, there is the possibility of tension. Wherever there's the possibility of tension, there's the possibility of conflict. Wherever there's the possibility of conflict, there's the possibility of violence. Cults share certain defining characteristics. In a cult, leaders recruit members through deceptive techniques that rob them of their identity and individuality. Experts have termed these techniques thought reform. Thought reform is a systematic effort which has two stages. One is the breakdown stage with heavy confession and a, a breakdown of one's own psychic integrity. 
And then there's the second stage, which is re-education, trying to remake a person into a new person. Case file, the family. Cult leader Charles Manson used a systematic program of drug use and sexual violation to break down his young recruit's resistance, rendering them vulnerable to Manson's bizarre re-education. The cult tends to focus on the leader and his needs as opposed to most religions. The focus would be on the community or upon worship. Case file, Branch Davidians. As leader of the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, David Koresh wasn't satisfied being followed as a preacher. He needed to be worshipped as a god. With Koresh demanding that the group members call him dad or father, and then that gradually moves to God the Father and actually God. Finally, cult leaders exploit members to fulfill their own needs for power and control. In many cases, the exploitation is financial or sexual, but at times, has taken an even darker form. The California Institution for Women is the largest penitentiary for women in the state of California. A model inmate for almost four decades, Leslie Van Houten is attending her 16th parole hearing. In ordinary circumstances, she would have a good chance of receiving parole. But Van Houten is no ordinary criminal. 37 years ago, before her life as an inmate, Leslie devoted her life to a cult. A cult led by Charles Manson. Los Angeles, 1968. California is the center of the hippie counterculture. Scores of suntan dropouts ready to bask in an endless summer of peace, love, and easy living. It was drugs, it was peace, it was free love. And people were in that state of mind to tune in and, and drop out. An 18-year-old former homecoming queen, Leslie Van Houten, had run away from home to join the hippie scene. After moving from commune to commune around California, Van Houten met a charismatic dropout named Charlie. At 34 years old, Charles Mills Manson had already lived a hard life. Born to a wandering teenage prostitute who tried to sell him for a pitcher of beer, Manson was thoroughly neglected as a child. His mother was a very loose woman, a drunk. She spent a good number of her early years and Charlie's early years herself in prison. Hard to raise a kid when you're in prison. So he was with, left with other people. And then he very soon found a life in prison himself. Burglary. Assault. Grand Theft Auto. By his mid-30s, Manson's rap sheet matched that of a career criminal. Virtually raised by the U.S. prison system, he had all the skills a cult leader needs. Here's a man whose life was one of being in and out of prison. He was very streetwise from that standpoint. I think he learned how to manipulate people in prison because that's part of the prison culture. When Charlie Manson was in prison, even a psychiatrist, a child psychiatrist that had seen him there said that he was quite the little politician and that he had learned to maneuver other people. He learned to deal with people, get into people's skins. After decades of honing his skills on his fellow inmates, Manson would put them to use on a new group. Lost and vulnerable young women like Van Houten. When he stepped back into society, he was able to lure the unsuspecting teenagers, the young girls who were looking for a purpose. Future cult members are in between high school and college, in between marriages, in between jobs, in a place where you're without moorings for a period of time. And so the in-betweener is very vulnerable to recruitment. By the time Leslie arrived, there were already lots of girls like her in the group. Susan Sadie Atkins, 20, a runaway who met Manson in San Francisco. Patricia Katie Krenwinkel, 21, who walked away from her home and her job to run away with Manson. Lynette Squeaky Fromm, 20, who found in Manson a way to escape her domineering father. Manson called them his family. Many of the 
these young girls runaways. And so he would say, oh, you have serious issues with your father or your mother. Well, you could just guess from the fact that they were runaways that that was the problem. But they, in their minds, thought, oh my gosh, here's somebody who understands me. The cult leaders have early experiences of neglect, of abandonment, of disappointment in parental figures and authorities. So then the dynamic is that they become the parent, the powerful parent, the omnipotent parent for the followers as they find them. To the outside world, Manson's family was a harmless hippie commune. But Manson himself was no hippie. Underneath the flower child exterior, he was a vicious, vengeful, power-hungry cult leader. The women were required to serve the men. They were to cook the food, they would be the providers in many instances. If the young women had children, Charlie made it a point to try to separate the women from their children. This was I think, part of his grand scheme to, to control and manipulate. To complete this control, Manson gave his girls LSD, sometimes two or three times a week. Soon he held power over their minds and bodies, commanding them to have sex with men he wanted to recruit. Like many cult leaders, Manson was able to sexually exploit his members because of the strength of his indoctrination. He had convinced the girls he was Christ incarnate. Using the girls as bait, Manson lured more and more men into the cult. With their addition to his growing family, Manson could finally start enacting his great plan, Helter Skelter. In December 1968, the Beatles released their White Album. From the first time he heard it, Manson believed the Beatles were speaking to him directly, telling him to start a race war that would lead to the destruction of the world. In his damaged mind, it was an opportunity for the ultimate power he had always craved. And at the end of the Armageddon, he would rise from the bottomless pit in the desert, along with his band of, of trusted followers, and he would end up ruling the country. And they would look for a leader, and he would emerge as, as that leader. In the songs of the White Album, Manson believed he found a window to biblical prophecy. The message was clear. In the frantic noise of Revolution No. 9, he heard the chaos of the apocalypse. And in Helter Skelter, he heard confirmation of his role as the second Christ. All of them knew about Helter Skelter because he would talk about it constantly. And that's the other part of sort of the indoctrination. You know, he would constantly repeat over and over again his plans, his philosophy, his theory as to what was going to happen. And if any family member was initially skeptical of this concept of Helter Skelter, if you keep hearing it over and over again while you're taking drugs and you're involved in this environment, eventually you begin to start believing. At age 19, Leslie Van Houten believed in Helter Skelter and in slave-like devotion to Charles Manson. She would take part in one of the most outrageous crimes of the century. As a teenager, Leslie Van Houten was indoctrinated to believe Charles Manson was God. And to help her God take over the world, she would become one of the most famous criminals in history. For decades, she has been denied parole. And though parole boards and lawyers change over the years, one other face has been here from the beginning. Victims' rights advocate, Deborah Tate. I have no hate or contempt for these people. However, I am extremely committed to keeping them exactly where they are. Deborah Tate's sister was the most well-known of Manson's victims. In 1969, Sharon Tate was a 26-year-old film starlet, pregnant and newly married to the director, Roman Polanski. But before she could become a Hollywood legend, her life would be taken in senseless violence. There's no guarantee that... For the last several years, Deborah Tate has attended the parole hearings of all former members of the Manson family. ...for their actions. parole consideration hearing for Leslie Van Houten. But Van Houten's case is the most controversial. Compared to the other Manson family members, she has been convicted of the fewest number of crimes, and if anyone is 
closest to being paroled it would be her. I just have to be here to remind society of exactly what it is we're talking about. And what we're talking about is cold-blooded, senseless murder. By 1969, Manson was obsessed with Helter Skelter, the song he believed foretold the end of the world. After a great apocalypse, Manson believed God would give him control of the earth and power over all its inhabitants. But the world had yet to see what grisly crimes would be enacted in the name of this bizarre scheme. August 9th, 10 p.m. Charles Manson drops off four of his cult members, Sadie, Katie, Linda, and Tex, at a randomly chosen house in a wealthy white neighborhood. Driven by their belief in Manson, the four cultists enact the plan devised to start Helter Skelter. One by one, they brutally beat, stab, strangle, and shoot their five victims, including actress Sharon Tate, who was stabbed 16 times in the back and chest. Her blood is used to write cryptic messages on the walls. When the murders were first reported, it sent a wave of fear throughout Los Angeles. It was very confusing. People didn't know what to think. People were very afraid because you have these random killers. The murders sent a wave of fear throughout the city. But they failed to start the apocalypse. Manson's vicious plot called for more murders. And he knew that his girls would be all too willing. The girls and the family viewed Charlie in a number of ways. As a father figure, as a lover, as Jesus Christ, as many of them thought he was. Basically as this presence that they loved and they were willing to, to do anything for. The next night, Manson drove to another randomly chosen house in a wealthy white neighborhood. This time, the group was slightly different. It included newcomer, Leslie Van Houten. With their murderous directive from Manson, the cultists enter the home of shop owners Rosemary and Lino LaBianca. There, Leslie and Katie stab Rosemary 41 times. Her husband Lino is stabbed 12 times with a knife and punctured 14 times with a carving crime scene photos are horrible. I mean, they carved war into Lino LaBianca's chest. There was a fork stuck in his chest as well. There was a knife embedded in his throat. Both of them begged for their lives, but to no avail. After the murders, Manson took his cult to a hiding place in Death Valley to wait for Helter Skelter. Two months later, authorities arrest members of the family on an unrelated charge. Only later would they be linked to the infamous Tate LaBianca murders. At only 20, Leslie Van Houten was charged with first-degree murder. Throughout the investigation, Manson's indoctrination of the girls remained strong. His was the only authority they recognized. Even when threatened with life imprisonment, they were unconcerned and remorseless. As the world watched, the Manson girls sung their way through a trial for murder. They were absolutely flip about it, as if nothing had happened, as if they were proud of what they had done, that there was no shame or no sense of wrong. Throughout the trial, Manson's strangle-like hold on the girls became more and more visible. When he carves an X into his forehead, the girls mutilate their own faces. When he shaves his head in protest, the girls follow suit. But petty demonstrations weren't enough. Manson wouldn't be satisfied until they had sacrificed their freedom and their futures. The jury is unanimous. Leslie Van Houten is convicted of first degree murder. The three defendants are eventually sentenced to life in prison. There's something that caused them to do such a horrible crime and to do it in a manner where there appears to be no remorse afterwards. And so when you have someone like that, the question becomes, can they ever really be rehabilitated? To say that they would be viable, functioning individuals in a free society, I, I just can't go, go with that. At Leslie Van Houten's 16th parole hearing, 
The arguments have been made, and the issues have been deliberated. As the news cameras wait, the parole board is about to give their decision. For 37 years, Leslie Van Houten has been behind bars. Since her arrest at age 19, she has been denied parole 15 times. Now, at her 16th parole hearing, the board will decide if she is still a danger to society. If Leslie Van Houten is the same person who brutally murdered innocent people under orders from Charles Manson. The members of the parole board are ready to announce their decision. Panel makes the following point. Those are needs to continue programming. In order to face discuss, understand, and hold stress and non-respect. Leslie Van Houten so will spend another respect. year in jail. Her cultic devotion to Charles Manson has cost her her freedom. Charles Manson was striking back at being neglected and abandoned. So what he did was ultimately set it up so that several young women who were about the age of his mother when she went into prison, and he sees to it that these women are going to spend the rest of their lives in prison. Manson's vengeance was complete. Almost 40 years after their cultic crimes, all three Manson girls remain imprisoned. But every parole hearing or attempted appeal is still a media circus. We all need to stand together and put our foot down um, and the hard work that she's done. Today. If the crime were committed today, the minimum sentence that she would have received for these... The world crimes. continues to be shocked by the naked cruelty of these decades-old crimes. But there are other equally shocking cults that the world has never heard of. Remote outposts of torture and death. Nestled in lush green mountains lies a ghost town few have ever seen. The clean white walkways are empty and the little houses stand abandoned. But the quaint Bavarian architecture disguises a horrific history. What resembles a village in the heart of Germany is a cult compound in the Andean foothills of Chile. In the 1950s, Paul Schaefer was the spiritual leader of a Baptist church in his native Germany. Extremely strict in his doctrine, Schaefer appealed to a group of pious Germans who believed in the cleansing power of penance and asceticism. But while preaching the heavenly virtues of self-denial, Schaefer himself indulged in disturbing perversities. Schaefer had been denounced for two or three episodes of abuses of children. So he had to find a way to get out of Germany and still have unlimited access to children. A compulsive pederast, Schaefer had been molesting the young boys of his congregation for years. When he came under suspicion of the German authorities, Schaefer fled with his congregation to the safety and anonymity of South America. In 1961, he purchased a large piece of land in a remote area several hours south of Santiago, Chile. There, he put his cult to work building an orphanage for Chilean children with whom he could enact his twisted fantasies. Heinz Kuhn, a German national, spent six years at the colony. Let me tell you something. If this were to happen to me today, I would never have gone. But when you were young, 19, 20 years old, you're not prepared for life, and anything is possible in a group. To the Chilean locals, Colonia Dignidad, the colony of righteousness, was a successful humanitarian organization. In a very short time, the cult had built a functioning hospital that tended to local poor, a large farm that grew a surplus of crops, and even a large commercial food unit that churned out German sausage and strudel to be sold in stores throughout the country. Schaefer turned his cult into a thriving business, 
with a glowing reputation and huge profits. Profits that were based on slave labor. As far as the religious preaching that had existed in Germany, it was like goodbye, nothing. Only work, work, work. All for God, all for something grand, something beautiful. We worked from the morning until night. And then the cement trucks would arrive and would continue again for two or three hours. Everybody unloading or building a house, placing roofing tiles. The motto was, work makes you free. The same motto was written on the gates of the concentration camps. Using the slogan of the Third Reich, Schaefer had built his own private slave camp. Cult members worked long days, often seven days a week. Refusal was out of the question, as public beatings and other sadistic discipline tactics became more and more common. But by the time these gradual changes had taken effect, it was too late. Escape was an impossible dream. And while Schaefer used the colony to bring in children for his sexual use, he found adult consensual sex sinful and grotesque. Residents of the colony were barred from having sex, even husbands and wives. Between 1982 and 1997, 15 years, not a single child was born in that place because he convinced everybody that sex was a crime, no matter what conditions. Sex between man and wife was a crime. Members of the colony feared Schaefer's vicious punishments, but celibacy was a rule almost no one could endure. Couples found ways to keep their sexual relationships secret, but when Heinz Kuhn impregnated his own wife, they were forced to attempt escape. With no money, no sense of geography, and only speaking German, the lovers were quickly caught and brought back to the colony hospital. The woman was given a forced abortion, while Kuhn endured his own personal hell. I was imprisoned in this hospital. I say imprisoned because it was against my will, with electroshock, pharmaceutical shock, and without giving me a drop of water for 15 days or more. Schaefer was particularly fond of using electroshock to discipline his cult. Men and women were given painful, sometimes crippling doses of electroshock to various parts of the body. And most tragically, as part of his twisted pedophilic philosophy, Schaefer implemented a bizarre plan to stop children from growing up. They treated the children to various processes that were aimed at inhibiting sexual development. It is documented that girls were treated to electroshock in the vagina, hormones were applied, because for Schaefer and for some of them, the fact that a girl develops into a woman it's a terrible thing. Like Manson and other cult leaders, Schaefer directed his most violent impulses towards women. Preaching that women were instruments of the devil, whose purpose was to tempt men to sin, Schaefer subjected girls to bizarre and painful experimentation. The colony's modern hospital had become a haven for torture, soon to be feared by the entire nation. In 1973, General Augusto Pinochet staged a coup that successfully took over the Chilean government and set up a military dictatorship. During Pinochet's 17-year reign, thousands of Chile's intellectuals and political dissidents were kidnapped, tortured, and killed. It was only a matter of time before the two vicious dictators met they become relevant for the militaries because they are a big place, well protected, uh, guaranteed from the point of view of security and information, and they became a center for torture, for training torturers. Chilean people that were detained by the Chilean police were taken to that place, were tortured, some of them were murdered, the corpses were disappeared. To this day, it is a matter of debate whether cult members knew their compound was a torture center for the Pinochet regime. But if they were ignorant to the government's activities, they were witnesses to Schaefer's increasing cruelty within the cult. 
I couldn't take it anymore. Every day, the same thing. Shouting at people, hitting people, abusing children. We were silly fools telling the outside world how good we were. After three attempts, Heinz Kuhn escaped Colonia Dignidad alone, unable to convince his wife to flee. It would be decades before Paul Schaefer's dark secrets were finally uncovered. In 2005, Paul Schaefer was apprehended on charges of physical and sexual abuse. After an eight-year manhunt, authorities were able to arrest Schaefer without endangering the lives of his cult members. It was one small victory in a world that is littered with cultic tragedy. April 19, 1993. Flames engulf the Mount Carmel compound outside Waco, Texas, killing more than 70 people. Under the leadership of David Koresh, the Branch Davidians, an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventists, had entered into a shootout with federal officials that ended with the disastrous fire. But violence was only a recent development in Branch Davidianism, a cult that spans back half a century. Like many cults, the Branch Davidians have a long history of millennialism, a belief that God will set up a utopian kingdom here on Earth. But the world we live in is so evil and corrupt, it must be destroyed to make way for God's millennium. In Charles Manson's mind, this would be accomplished by an apocalyptic race war. But for the Davidians, it would come through the prophecies described by the Bible and the book of Revelation. The biblical book of Revelation is almost hallucinatory in its imagery. It's lush, it's extravagant, it has trumpets, it has monsters, it has almost anything that a fevered mind could imagine. And one of its early scenes is a scene of God seated on a throne holding a scroll that is sealed with seven seals. In the book of Revelation, the Lamb of God begins breaking each of the seals, unleashing events that destroy the earth. Since their beginning, Branch Davidians have been obsessed with this description of apocalypse and determining when it will happen. The one thing we know about millennial groups is that none of them has been right yet. But that hasn't stopped people from trying to figure out when the end will actually come. In 1957, the Mount Carmel community sprang up in the dusty plains of West Texas. From here, the Davidian message of imminent apocalypse would travel all the way to Australia, where it was heard by a young Adventist named Clive Doyle. Ever since becoming Seventh-day Adventist, I had been interested in Bible prophecy. And so living in an age when you figure God's going to finally do something after 2,000 years, you know, it uh, was kind of exciting. In 1966, Doyle came to Texas to join the Mount Carmel community. Through 25 years as a practicing Davidian, he followed a succession of Davidian leaders, or prophets. One of the important things to remember about the Advent this tradition is this notion of present truth, which makes it almost an expectation that there will be someone in each generation who will have prophetic guidance for the community. In 1981, Vernon Howell, a 22-year-old failed musician from Houston, had been looking for someone to translate the Bible's apocalyptic prophecies. At Mount Carmel Center, Vernon met the newest Davidian prophet, a 68-year-old woman named Lois Roden. Impressed by Roden and her prophecies, Vernon soon became a regular fixture at the compound but he didn't make much of an impression. Vernon Howell was not on the fast track to worldly success from the beginning. He had reading problems, dyslexia. He did not make it through high school. I don't think there was anything particularly about him that impressed me. I mean, you know, he wasn't sort of charismatic or, or a personality that drew people. He didn't seem to have any friends. Though some saw him as a loner, 
it is clear that Vernon had one friend, the Davidian leader, Lois Roden. In fact, some Davidians claimed that the 22-year-old boy physically seduced the 68-year-old widow, appealing to her with a prophecy of his own. When David Koresh first joined, Lois Roden saw him as basically a cocky, narcissistic young man. But when he came to her and said, God has pictured me as your husband and as the father of a sacred child, I think that blew her away. As Vernon Hell deepened his relationship with Lois Roden, it became clearer and clearer that she was going to groom him to be her successor. With Roden's endorsement, Vernon Howell succeeded her as leader of the Mount Carmel community. And because the Davidians were already indoctrinated to believe in modern prophets, Vernon had a compliant group from the start. One of the things that Lois Roden saw in Vernon Howell and then that other members of the community started to see in him as well was his ability to show connections that pointed to the conclusion that the Branch Davidians had always hoped for, that the end of time is coming soon. In preparation for Christ's new kingdom that would come after the apocalypse, Vernon decided to make a trip to the site where that kingdom would form the Holy Land, Israel. There he would be given the power that all cult leaders so desperately crave. The turning point for him was a trip to Israel when he appears to have experienced what he described as an ascent into the heavens, where he went up into the heavens, spoke to God face to face, and came back a changed man. It was as a result of that experience that he decided that he was the Lamb of God, mentioned in the book of Revelation, who could unseal the scroll sealed with seven seals. As the Lamb of God, Howell believed he was more than a mere man. His God had called out to him, giving him the authority to act out his fantasies fantasies that would bring the attention of the FBI and the world. Waco, 1985. Just arrived from a trip to Israel, Vernon Howell is convinced of his new purpose. No longer just the prophet of the Branch Davidians, he has been chosen to be the Lamb of God and charged with beginning the apocalypse. The apocalypse for David and for many of these destructive cult leaders is sort of the ultimate power trip. He's actually usurping Christ. He's rewriting scripture. Flush with pride, Vernon takes on the majestic name David. He believes that God has made him the new king who will rule over the coming apocalypse. But his visitation with God has given him an even more horrifying power. There are two major turning points in David Koresh's time with the Branch Davidians. The first one is his religious experience in Israel. The second one is when he announces what he called a new light revelation, which essentially reserved all female members of the group for Koresh. His new role as God's son gave David unlimited power in the cult. And like so many cult leaders, he would use this power to sexually abuse his members. But the women of the cult wouldn't be enough. David needed to fulfill his sexual needs with children. The people with whom David Koresh had sex ranged from very, very young, 13 or so, uh, up through substantially older than that. Uh, there is no question that he was having sexual relations with underage children. With his unquestioned authority, Koresh used sex to fulfill his own needs for power and adoration. And while the children couldn't stand up for themselves, the adults didn't protect them either. David did have a relationship with other women, some of which we know, because he believed this is what I accepted, what I've come to uh, buy into, you might say. He believed God told him to do this. The parents of the children didn't intervene for a variety of reasons. But one is that for committed members, all of this is subsumed under a greater drama of salvation in light of the impending end of days. 
In the shadow of the coming apocalypse, Clive Doyle and the other Branch Davidians easily accepted David's sexual doctrine. They accepted David's role as the Lamb of God and obeyed his word as though it were God's. Even when he ordered the stockpiling of illegal weapons. It was introduced to us that Christ told his disciples if they had any extra money, if they had an extra coat or something, go out and sell it and buy a weapon. They even go to church with their weapons, to their religious meetings. They're in the upper room for the Last Supper with weapons on them. February 28, 1993. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms receives a search warrant for the Mount Carmel compound on the grounds that Davidians possess unlawfully modified automatic weapons. There are also rumors of child abuse and drug manufacture. The ATF expected to come out after about a half hour with several people in handcuffs and lots and lots of ATF officers carrying boxes uh, of illegal weapons that they could then display to the TV cameras that had been alerted that something was happening at the Mount Carmel Center. And things went horribly wrong. At about 9.30 a.m., ATF agents drive into Mount Carmel in an attempt to execute search warrants against David Koresh and the compound. As the first agents approach, gunfire erupts. Four ATF agents are killed and 15 are wounded. An undetermined number of Davidians are killed and injured. I think there was a lot of shock with the initial raid. Guys jumping out with guns and shooting almost instantly was a shock. There's so much happening. Bullets coming through the walls, through the ceilings, up through the floors. The details of the assault are still controversial, as both the ATF and the Davidians claim that the other side fired the first shot. What is clear is that the authorities were unaware that their actions would be interpreted in a religious context. As FBI trucks surrounded the compound, the Davidians imagined they were entering into a final apocalyptic battle. I believe in a devil. I believe the devil hates God, and the devil can't get at God except through us. In our case, I believe the devil saw the potential for what David was teaching, that the end of this world was drawing close, and I think he wanted to put an end to it. On Monday, April 19th, 51 days after the initial assault by federal authorities, the Mount Carmel compound erupted in flames. Clive Doyle narrowly escaped the crumbling building. I began to hear people behind me screaming, and I knew who they were. I, I recognized the voices. I guess that kind of galvanized me. I jumped up and lurched in the direction I figured the hole was, even though it was pitch black, you know, and I somehow stumbled out. Nine Branch Davidians escaped the crumbling inferno, leaving 76 that died in the flames, including David Koresh. I think in looking for responsibility for what happened at the Mount Carmel Center, it's seductive and seductively wrong on both sides to say evil cult members killed themselves and others, and a rogue government incinerated citizens. Somewhere between those lies some of the truth. Policing cultic violence is a dangerous and complicated task. Cults come in unpredictable varieties, from disorganized gangs to groups with military-like precision. As cults continue to appear in new and